Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome you to the Asia Pacific Heart Rhythm Society SVT, SVT module webinar series. Um, I am Chi Kyung from Singapore, one of the EP doctors, and we have with us today two other speakers who will share how we may approach difficult SVTs, difficult EGMs in the EP lab to help make the catheter ablation a successful procedure for the patient. Uh, with me is uh, Professor Chen Ming Long. He's from Nanjing, a good friend and a very experienced and seasoned uh, EP physician. I've personally learned a lot from him on how we approach difficult cases. With me is also Dr. Paul Lim. He is a attending consultant for EP in my center, National Heart Center, Singapore. So the objectives of, of this webinar is really to highlight some of the interesting or perhaps perplexing EGMs that we may encounter during the course of EP study and catheter ablations for SVT. How we could make sense of those EGMs. Number two, how do we make use perhaps of 3D maps to localize interesting or suitable ablation sites that maintains the SVT. And lastly, how we may do this in a safe manner so that we achieve success in treating SVT for this patient. Uh, feel free uh, on the screen, you will see that uh, uh, there are a few buttons. Feel free to post Q&A and we could poll the panelists and ask difficult questions or any queries on the EGMs. There will be uh, polling questions for some of these slides. Take your time to go through them and poll so that we could focus and direct our discussion based on the results of the poll. Um, we, we will end on time, I promise you. And in, if uh, the situation permits, we may even end earlier. By 11.30 Singapore time, we will finish so that the rest uh, may enjoy the weekend uh, during this uh, pandemic, wherever you may be. Without further ado, uh, sh shall we start the, the case uh, discussion? Okay, let me share screen. All right, do you have, I assume you will see my screen, is that correct? Yes. Okay, good. Yep. Right. Okay, this is uh, the first case that I have. All right, you see it's a 45 year old lady recurrent SVT, uh, film ablation of node one had a, uh, in the left free wall for concealed left lateral accessory pathway. Apparently she had SVT subsequently, went for a second and third ablation. It was diagnosed to have a, to have a right parahesian atrial tachycardia. Right, and this is the uh, EGM, the critical EGM, uh, that we managed to record and observe repeatedly in the EP lab. Take some time to th think, look through this, and uh, what do you think the diagnosis is? Is this AVNRT? Is this AVRT? Is this an ATAC? Or we need more information? Let's poll. I thought I said everybody, I mean, do we have enough polls? Yeah, that's okay. Thank. How many do we have? Maybe uh, um, I, I would advise everyone to possible just poll. It doesn't matter. Uh, don't worry about getting right or wrong. Okay, good. Z uh, only, only one, two person poll. Okay, good, good, good. All right, we have about 38%, a little bit more.
So shall we end the poll? Okay, let's do 30 seconds and we end. Good. Okay, so 22% um, think it's an AVNRT, 40% uh, thinks uh, it's an AVRT, and 15% thinks an ATAC, and uh, those who choose option four is always correct. You know, we always it's always good to have more information. Uh, but all right, okay. So for my fellow panelists, feel free to chip in. So this is a narrow complex tachycardia or, um, of cycle length 390 millisecond. All right, during tachycardia, the V to the A interval is 225. I do apologize that the His is not well seen on this uh, strip. And you have a PVC during a reported, reported His refractoriness. And you can see that PVC brings forward the next atrial activation. And in fact, the A to A timing is 355 uh, millisecond. There are also other critical indicators. For example, the VA is 225. The stim V to the A is about 300. The difference is 75. Whereas the PPI from here, uh, measure from here, uh, from, from, the, from the RV to here is about 520. Uh, the difference being about uh, how much? 130. All right. So I think this is where things are a little confusing. Uh, any comment from our panelists? How, how do we reconcile differences in such uh, intervals? What about Paul? So the, the, the issue is the discrepancy between the V, uh, v to stim minus the V to A time during tachycardia versus the PPI minus tachycardia cycle length. And uh, this is one of the classic uh, situations where there is some component of the tachycardia circuit that uh, may change, right? That uh, the, the atrial ventricular conduction or the, the, the atrial ventricular node in this case uh, may decrement because um, as we can see here, the, PV, the PVC uh, is delivered um, at the cycle length of 320 milliseconds compared to the tachycardia cycle of 390 milliseconds. So there's a significantly shortened uh, coupling interval. And uh, this, in this case, it would be really, really nice to have, uh, to be able to see the kiss, which unfortunately yes. we don't have here. Yeah, but Very maybe good. we can measure the A to V, uh, maybe we can measure the A to V interval in this circumstance and measure which is the component that has prolonged. Um, or the other way is to just, well, you, we know that the VA time minus the, the steam A time rather, minus the VA time naturally omits the component of decrementation uh, from the AV node. So that would, be, that would be primarily what to look out for. The other way is to, if we have a HIST, we can do a corrected PPI minus tachycardia cycle length, where we look for the, the prolongation of the AH interval and minus this off from the PPI minus uh, tachycardia cycle length. So to reconcile this, uh, the VA time minus DMA time and account for AH prolongation. A very good comment. That's correct. You know, there are two limbs to the tachycardias, wh whether the prolongation is in the anti-grade limb or retrograde limb. So uh, my personal take, uh, in addition to making all the corrected V steam to A PPI intervals, would be, uh, I rely more on the, the stim to A interval, the difference between the stim to A interval and the V interval uh, to differentiate between pathway or atypical AV and RT. And let me show you with you, the most pathways shows a decrement or rather a typical all or none behavior uh, and that the stim to A in a pathway does not prolong as much as a steam to A in a atypical AVNRT, which shows decremental property. Of course, the caveat is that this patient may have a decremental uh, concealed pathway and that you have a prolonged steam to A. Any other comments? If, if not, um, well, I think this in this slide, it goes for an AVRT, a pathway mediated tachycardia. And um, in a redo case, we went on to, to map in the right atrium. 
All right, so we, we map, and this is the picture of the right atrium. A limited map, yellow, yellow dots refers to the uh, his uh, region, and you see this broad area. Mm. Do, we, do we think, hey, this is a pathway maybe near this area, maybe near the AB node, ought to be more, a bit more careful, we go ahead and ablate. Shall we remap the right atrium, map the left atrium, or, or ask for help? Maybe I ask uh, Dr. Chen, what, what do you think of, of this map? And what are your thoughts and, and, uh, and, and the suggestion? So Dr. Chen, uh, this is a good map. And I think the, uh, because the, the oldest activation almost, you know, in the huge region. So normally for extra pathway, I think the, 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 the uh, oldest activation is like a hotspot, not like a whole region like this. So you should map the neighboring structures, the uh, non coronary cusp or maybe left edge. So that's words of wisdom from an experienced operator. In, in short, he meant this looks funny, looks broad. We should yeah. either remap or map other structures. So in interest of time, we went on uh, to the lab atrium. And this is the uh, mapped the EGM during tachycardia. You will see that the ablation catheter is on the mitral valve annulus about four o'clock position. There is a uh, small little A. There seems to be a split A. You can see here a small A here, another A. The earliest mm -hmm. is about V to 880 millisecond. As we move the catheter to the mitral valve annulus lateral for well, three o'clock vision, you see the VA comes in very early, 160 millisecond. And the low far few, what seems to be split like split CS signals on the lateral uh, CS region. So with this, uh, I think we then, of course, remap um, an activation map on the left atrium. Mm -hmm. And let me show you the picture. All right, a limited map. And it shows that the earliest VA timing is actually on the lateral annulus of the mitral valve. This is a AVRT involving a concealed left lateral accessory pathway. In short, the pathway that was ablated previously has recurred. And why do we see a concentric or septal activation of the age? Let me show you. It was extensively ablated previously, and as a result, the patient, or rather the operator, has achieved a conduction block in the coronary sinus region, just septal to the location of the accessory pathway. Hence, when the ablation catheter is placed here, you see a split atrial electrogram along the CS. And the act activation seems to be from septal to this toe. And that's because there is a conduction block. As a result, during tachycardia, when the pathway conducts retrogradely from the ventricle to the atrium, it meets a, a, a block line. It, it conducts across the Buckman bundle and down the interatrial septum back to the lateral CS in a septal to a distal activation. So in short, this is a patient with a recurrent recurrence uh, of a left lateral concealed accessory pathway. So things to learn in patients who had a repeated uh, SVT ablation, go in with uh, a fresh mindset. And when you map and you think it's a right-sided parahesian nature attack, as mentioned by Dr. Chen, um, the activation map is unusual. You should map surrounding structures. And when you do that, you realize that it is a recurrent uh, activation or recovery of the left, previously ablated left lateral accessory pathway. All right, so that's what we did. I uh, went there and you could see that on ablation, there is then VA dissociation. All right, maybe uh, one more case before I hand it over. Any comments? Feel free to comment, anyone. Actually, I wonder about the 12 lead ECG during the tachycardia. Maybe we might have seen uh, P waves that come ne that are negative in lead one, perhaps, because the, the VA time was quite split, so it's not really buried. We might be able to see um, distinct P waves, and that might have given us a hint to where the, uh, which, which area of connection 
the pathway was, perhaps. Excellent comment. That's a very good tool. All right, let me move on to a second case. 54-year-old man, WPW pattern ECG, palpitations, normal ECG. This is a, just a 12V to show a pre-excited uh, ECG. Of note, uh, V1 is positive, you know, it's left-sided. All right, uh, lead one, a little positive before it goes negative. You suspect it to be probably left lateral MOs, um, maybe two, three o'clock region on the mitral annulus for this manifest pathway. Um, a baseline just to show that A, H, and V, the H is uh, Barrett or on time with the onset of QRS. This is expected in a person with WPW ECG. All right, and this was the first pacing maneuver that we did, uh, what we call right ventricular straight pacing. And we observed this at a critical cycle length. All right, um, we have V pacing, it conducts, uh, seems to be a septal manner, proximal to distal CS. And as you shorten the pacing interval, as it more and more pre-excited or premature, uh, you see a eccentric atrial activation earliest in the distal CS region. So the question is, do you think this is from nodal to pathway, pathway to pathway, or we have no more information? As mentioned, more information is always uh, good, but what do you think? Is it nodal to accessory pathway, or pathway to pathway conduction in this RV uh, pacing? As in, um, let me correct my English, the, uh, the statement here. I mean, I mean, did it switch from nodal conduction to accessory pathway conduction or switch from one pathway conduction to another pathway conduction. Uh, please, Paul. I think it was at the same rate, correct? Uh, no, it's slightly faster. Uh, faster, okay. A little faster. It's a straight pacing, decremental uh, and rather uh, our uh, ramp pacing. Sorry, my, I mean, straight pacing, my, my, my apologies. So 24 thing is from nodal, uh, fifth, half of them thinks it's from nodal to accessory pathway, switch from nodal to accessory pathway conduction uh, in this retrograde assessment. About one third, about 33% thinks it's from, it's switched from a pathway to pathway conduction. Good, very good, very good uh, observation. You're right. Um, it could go for a person with robust, uh, retrograde nodal, AB nodal conduction, switch from that to a uh, pathway conduction. Mm. Uh, I just want to share that, you know, um, in many cases, not all, uh, in, especially in older folks, when we do successfully ablate the concealed accessory pathway, they tend, they tend, not all, but they tend to have VA dissociation. That's the observation that we see. Uh, so bear that in mind. Well, more information is correct. We need more information. But I looking at this, I, I just suspect it might be switching from pathway to pathway conduction. Just a suspicion. Not 100% sure. All right, let's see the next thing. Same thing, you can see that with this interval, all right, uh, uh, single extra premature uh, RV pacing, 600. 300, you see that it switched from this pattern to this pattern. So same question, with it nodal to pathway or pathway to pathway? Uh, so, you know, we will need more information after uh, more maneuvers or uh, subsequent ablation. To cut a long story short, he does have uh, AVRT involving the left lateral mm -hmm. pathway. We went on to map. You could see the uh, map integrally, the, AP or pathway potential, went on to ablate and we uh, caused a loss of uh, pre-excitation on the surface ECG. And then we studied and we see the, the same features, retrograde RV pacing. This is uh, 510, 270. The stim to the measured A remains the same. So my question is, is this nodal? Is it accessory pathway conduction? Let's pull.
All right, I think two thirds, sixty-eight percent believe that this is a accessory pathway. Any comment from Dr. Chen? I'm new. I think this is the uh, behavior of the retrograde conduction over the X pathway because you 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 see. So uh, this is he's found the recording here. So when you, when you stimulate the right ventricle, you can see that the VA conduction over the his area is much, much longer. And the OLIS activation is located at CS, uh, very proximal CS78, uh, right? Correct. So I, yeah, these figures are uh, supporting the extra pathway if the, the his uh, recording is at the right place. Very, very good comment. You know, you know guys, when we do a retrograde uh, series, we paste a right ventricle pace the RV and it conducts to the atrium, we would begin to see a um, decrement in the VA time at about low 300 milliseconds. In, mm -hmm. oh, when you do your EP study, you realize that you have RV at 600 and then the S2 at say 320 or 330, you begin to see prolongation of the steam to A. And then you will prolong further and that suggests nodal yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. In this case, you do not see any changes. Yeah. 550 to 70 is, is, is the same. So, very good comment. This are uh, accessory pathway uh, conduction retrograde, a uh, concealed accessory pathway uh, conduction. So, we went on to do a, a parahisian. Uh, you could see that the in the parahisian pacing at high output, the QRS is narrow. And then in low output, the QRS widens, and you then measure the steam to the A between parhesian capture versus RV capture, and you see that there's no difference. And, and this further reinforces the fact that retrograde conduction is via an accessory pathway. Uh, and we went on to map. All right, uh, it turned out that he has a left posterior septal accessory pathway, which is the earliest. And when you turn on the ablation, you see that there is then VA dissociation, loss of conduction and VA dissociation. So this a case illustrates uh, also one more point that commonly, not all the time, commonly in patients with a concealed pathway or a manifest pathway, post ablation or eradication of the accessory pathway, they tend, not all the time to, most commonly, they have VA dissociation. If not, the VA will decrement. And you may want to do other things to uh, assess retrograde conduction. Um, so this is what you had, post ablation. So be mindful that patients may have multiple pathways. In this case, it has a bidirectional uh, conducting left lateral manifest pathway and a concealed left posterior uh, septal pathway. With that, I want to thank you for uh, these two cases. Let me invite uh, Paul to present his cases and we leave the, la the best for the last uh, with Dr. Chen sharing his case. Paul, yes, over to you. So, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, very clearly. Okay. This was a patient with white complex technique idea. The EGM is on the left, and the 12 lead ECG morphology is on the right. Premature atrial complexes were delivered during technique idea. So, it's your diagnosis. One, Halfway mediated tachycardia, two, pre excited AVNRT, three, atrial tachycardia, four, VT.
Are we polling the the? Are we doing doing a poll, Hai Tao? So all right, I think 42% believe that it is a pathway mediated tachycardia. 27% uh, thinks it's a pre-excited AVNRT and the rest uh, are distributed equally between an ATAC and a VT. Paul, over to you. Thank you for your response. The answer is one pathway mediated tachycardia. Let's discuss. We first talk about the observations and subsequently explain the findings. There is a white complex tachycardia with a left bundle branch block like morphology. The tachycardia cycle length is 270 milliseconds. A late PAC is delivered at the high RA catheter. Note that the PAC does not immediately change the tachycardia cycle length recorded at the coronary cycle. This PAC delays the immediate ventricular signal. And the QRS morphology of the delayed ventricular signal is similar to that of the tachycardia QRS. Following the delayed ventricular signal, the next atrial signal is delayed. And we see that the tachycardia is reset and continues at 270 milliseconds. This is evidence of pathway mediated tachycardia in antidromic reaction tachycardia. Let's explain this. Antigroid conduction to the ventricle is via accessory pathway conduction and is maximally pre-excited. The retrograde limb of the tachycardia is via the histopathy system. A PAC was delivered during retrograde his refractoriness as the PAC did not change PF activation immediately. The CF signal was at the same coupling interval as the tachycardia of 270 milliseconds, indicating that the CF activation was from the tachycardia wave front, from the V via the his and back to the A, and not from the PAC. This is important to show that any change to the tachycardia cycle length due to the PAC is not from conduction via the histopathy system and is from extranodal conduction. This PAC delays the immediate V with the same pre-excited morphology as the tachycardia, indicating the same site of conduction from A to B as the tachycardia, and results in a delay of the AA interval by the same amount, and subsequently reset. The Post excitation is classical of ART with a detrimental accessory pathway participating in the tachycardia. Looking at the differentials of white complex tachycardia, a PAC during VT will not post delay the VT. A PAC may bring forward or delay AVNRT, but this is for the subsequent V and not the immediate V that is affected. A PAC will not result in a delay in the V in atrial tachycardia without bringing forward the CSA. Okay. So there we have the explanation. Um, Prof. Chen, Prof. Chen, any comments? Good. No further comments. Quite good. Yeah, very good uh, explanation. Um, I think I think people for those who have voted VT, uh, I think like what Dr. Paul Lim said, if you have a PAC, if it captures a ventricle, you will see capture or fusion beat, right? And if you are able to get into the tachycardia with concealed entrainment, so to speak, a single beat entrainment, then you know the atrium is part of the circuit. Uh, if the atrium is part of the circuit, then you exclude, you know, it's a AV reentrant, AV nodal reentrant, tachycardia. So that can exclude it uh, nicely. So this is one good, one good trick. Um, I think, Paul, you show a very nice case where it, it actually post excites. Um, most commonly, or more commonly, it kind of pre-excites. But post-excite rules in the presence 
and the participation of that decremental pathway. I think that's a very good learning point. Over to you, Paul. Just a little bit more on this case. This is a basement healthy ECG for this patient with very subtle pre expectation. This is the classic RS pattern in lead 3, which is reported to be a feature seen in patients with decremental atrial fascicular or atrial ventricular pathway. This was seen in 60% of patients with this pathway compared to 6% of controls in this study. These are the other features that we saw during the EP study. On the left, we see a short HV interval with very subtle pre excitation. The middle EGMs show progressive decrementation and pre excitation at the same time. Here we see prolongation of the AV interval or A to delta wave interval and progressively more pre excited to RS appearing. Unfortunately, we do not have a good case signal for this theory. We would have seen shortening of the HV interval with AV prolongation and progressive pre-excitation. On the right, we see the onset of white complex tachycardia, which was antidromic tachycardia that we saw. Um, the first beat is subtly pre-excited. Then we observe block through the AV node and exclusive conduction down the accessory pathway. And then from then on, tachycardia commences. The experimental pathway includes atrial particular pathways with connection from the atrium to the fascicle, and also atrial ventricular pathways, which can be long, where they insert distally in the ventricle, or they could be short, where the insertion is just next to the tricuspid area. They are usually on the right, they are decremental and classically and degradedly conducting only. They can display automaticity, evidence during ablation, and also may respond to adenosine. This is an activation map of antidromic tachycardia with the combination of the right atrium and right ventricle. This shows that the earliest ventricular activation is near the tricuspid annulus and the 9 o'clock position. The ablation catheter is positioned at this spot. And note that the ventricular signal at the ablation is earlier than the ventricular signal at the RV catheter. These features are consistent with a short decremental atrial ventricular pathway. In a long atrial ventricular pathway or an atrial fascicular pathway, the ventricular electrogram at the RV will usually precede the catheter at the annular. With regard to mapping of decremental atrial fascicular or long atrial ventricular pathway, the approach is slightly different from that of a short AV path. Mapping during antigrade conduction is done as the pathways are usually exclusively antigrade conducting only. And potentials or my high potentials are small amplitude signals at the annular which arise from the pathway. These are targeted for ablation. However, in one phase of patients, this cannot be observed. And other strategies include mapping the shortest atrial stimulus to pre excitation or ablating at a site where mechanical trauma causes cessation of pathway conduction. Case two. This is a baseline EGM of a patient who had broad complex tachycardia. His baseline ECG QRS was narrow pre sedation. However, post sedation had this appearance. What are your observations? One, premature atrial contraction. Two, pathway conduction. Three, detrimental pathway properties. Four, two for one conduction. Five, AV nodal echoes. And six, all are reversed.
I thought you, I think you, um, um, for the attendees, I, I think you may have to vote again. I think the, I think the, the voting, oh, okay. Maybe a bit more time. Okay, I think they vote. The, the... Uh, I think the poll doesn't quite work for this question. I think let's carry on. It's, it's fine. Paul, why don't you take us through this uh, tracing? Thank you for your input. Actually, we see all of the other. Let's look at this EGM in detail. Firstly, we see premature atrial compactors which are likely catheter and you. We see early signal at the his catheter, and also we see a polarity change, indicating that the premature atrial compact arises from the catheter. The second EGM is also similar. This QRS following the second PAC has a broad QRS morphology with the delta wave. It's similar to the fourth, fifth, and sixth QRS, which are preceded by sinus deep. There's a very short HB interval, and the V EGM on the RV capital precedes that of the V EGM on the His capital. This is suggestive of pre-excitation. Also, the patient's baseline QRS was narrow prior to this sedation, but post sedation, pre-excitation becomes manifest at rest for increased vagal tone and decreased AV loader conduction velocity. Going back to the first QRS complex, as to why it's not pre-excited. The PAC is catheter induced at the hip, and due to the proximity of the AV node to the hip, production preferentially went down the normal hip secondary system instead of via the accessory pathway. But in addition to that, there is another reason for the narrow QRS, which is pathway decrement. The A to B interval in the first QRS is short, and the QRS is narrow. However, in the second catheter induced PAC, we see a prolonged A to B or A to delta wave interval and then more pre excitation. Also, the A to delta wave interval for subsequent pre excitation varies compared to the first. This suggests decremental pathway property and also was confirmed during subsequent and great testing. We also observed two for one conduction from the second PAC and also from the sinus deep. So one atrial signal conducts to two ventricular signals. First, via the fast pathway with concomitant pre excitation, and then the second, via the slow AV nodal pathway with blocked accessory pathway conduction. The his signal precedes the ventricular signal, and we see this a few more times in addition to what is observed here. This repeated appearance suggests dual AV nodal physiology rather than just coincidental junctional beat. Here we see AV nodal echoes. The narrow QRS complexes are followed by atrial signal with short VA intervals of 80 milliseconds with concentric atrial activation and they occur repeatedly. These are consistent with AV nodal echoes in the presence of dual AV nodal physiology that was observed prior. Decremental pathways are classically non retrogately conducting and therefore are unlikely to contribute to these echoes. To summarize, we have seen all the features listed above. Of course, it's hard to actively rule out other differentials based on this EGM alone. And we proceeded to do a proper EP study after that. This patient turned out to have a decremental atrial fascicular or long atrial ventricular pathway, which was ablated and the tricuspid annulus with concomitant view AV nodal physiology but no inducible AV and RT.
So this is a uh, this is quite a, a difficult EGM, honestly. Um, any comments from the panelists, or any? Let's let's maybe we can stop for questions from the audience also. Hey Paul, thanks uh, for that EGM. Um, sometimes we have this very difficult, you know, uh, make, difficult to make sense of, of all the EGM uh, features on the recording, on the strip. So my advice or my take is that we look at what is repeatedly reproducible. And you could see on this EGM that the uh, pad, you know, white left bundle branch block and a narrow uh, QRS, whether that is paired and that is repeatedly reproducible. If it's repeatedly reproducible, then there should be a EP explanation and phenomenon. Right? If, if it's uh, incidental, then I tend to attribute it to PACs due to catheter maneuvers or manipulation and hence pay a little less attention to that. So please look at what is repeatedly reproducible. And I suppose this is repeatedly reproducible, a recognized phenomenon throughout the study, and hence uh, there is an explanation for that. So honestly, I, I think also that um, this, the EGMs, it's very difficult to just uh, come to definite conclusions with one, uh, just one based on one EGM. And naturally, a full study needs to be Perform to establish consistency also in just as a stretch to what Prof Ching said. All right, if there are no other questions, uh, I want we're going to uh, leave the best uh, to the last. And Dr. Chen, please share uh, your screen and share with us some of the cases, uh, the difficult cases that you have handled and how we could learn, you know, share some of the tips and tricks in handling difficult SVT ablation. Over to you, Dr. Chen. Dr. Ching, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, good morning, Dr. Ching, uh, Dr. Paul, uh, and the dear EP uh, colleagues. Good morning. So uh, I'm a uh, pleasure to be invited by Dr. Ching to uh, uh, have this uh, case discussion. So my uh, case discussion will, will be focused on the uh, right atrial free wall extra pathway uh, so let's uh, first take a look at the uh, pathology and the histology of the extra pathway. So the, this is the uh, left-sided uh, histology of the extra pathway. You can see the left-sided extra pathway connecting the atrial myocardium to the ventricular myocardium and often a string, uh, very narrow band. So you can see here, very narrow. So this is a narrow band of the extra pathway connecting the atrium to the uh, ventricles. And, but sometimes it can be uh, epicardial. So this is the uh, epicardial fat, but sometimes it's not so close to the endocardial. And sometimes because of the coronary sinus, it can be epicardial. And some of the cases, the uh, atrial insertion point and ventricular insertion point is not at the uh, same spot, so the uh, pathway will be oblique This is the left extra pathway. But look at the right extra pathway. So this is the atrial myocardium of the right side, and this is the ventricular myocardium. So this is the TV annulus, the leaflet, and you can see the extra pathway, almost the direct connection between the atrium and the ventricular muscles. So you can see most of the right-sided extra pathway is broadband, uh, sometimes have multiple connections. So this is the uh, histology of the right-sided extra pathway, but in some of the patients of the uh, septal pathway, often it's close to the conduction uh, system. And in this region, so we can see this is the septal pathway. Uh, this is the AV node, so they are very uh, close by, so when you ablate the extra pathway here, sometimes you are risky. So 
these are the different locations of the histology of extra pathway. So extra pathway easy, often is very easy to, to be blocked by cast ablation and often are the cases for the EP starters. So this is the total case volume in our center. So this is our last year's total case volume. So almost uh, uh, 2,500 cases, but you can see the extra pathway almost 500, but most of the cases are done by the fellows or by the uh, EP starters, but sometimes you do have the uh, uh, tough cases. So these are the challenges for extra pathway ablation. Some of the cases, they, they have abnormal uh, anatomic structure and some of the uh, extra pathway causes are very complex. They are epi either epicardial, multiple connections, or sometimes broadband or in oblique cross and different, difficult to uh, differentiate, like uh, Dr. Ching and Dr. Paul, uh, they discuss two uh, uh, cases, very difficult. Sometimes it's tricky, it's uh, hard to differentiate uh, at a short time. So uh, the, these are the special conduction fibers, slow extra pathways, or sometimes the septal pathways, very close to his bundle. So these pathways, so need, you need to take some time to make differentiation. And also the, the, the challenge of the extra pathway ablation is NH problem and the catheter uh, stability. This is more pronounced on the right side for the right side uh, free wall extra pathway. So catheter stability sometimes is a problem. And also the, the close vicinity to the conduction system. So this can cause the ablation uh, lesions to uh, produce the, uh, the uh, AV conduction uh, delay. So uh, uh, sometimes in this specific region, the uh, ablation, the, the, even the diagnosis is easier, but the ablation is risky. Today I will focus on the challenges of the right apron free wax pathway ablation. So these, are, these challenges are the epicardial multiple connections broadband, and sometimes the, because of the catheter instability. So the, the uh, first case report of the uh, uh, epicardial extra pathway on the right side is by Dr. Goya. And this is direct connection from the right appendage to the uh, right free wall of the ventricle or even the base of the outflow tract, the, the anterior wall. So this is the direct connection. Uh, obviously, this is the uh, epicardial pathway. And the second report, this is a uh, uh, case series report by uh, Dr. Uh, Sunny Jackman. So you can see the several cases of the patients with right, ex right free wall extra pathway are the direct connection, connections from the appendage to the RV free wall. So here's the uh, example. So normally there's, this is the annulus. So, so annular, uh, annulus tissue are the connective tissue. So often the, this is the, not the, uh, uh, without uh, electric conduction, but most of the extra pathways, there's the connection between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And this is easy to be blocked by cat ablation. But some of the cases, they are truly epicardial. So the insertion point of the atrial side is far away from the uh, annulus region. So if you map from the annulus region, you cannot really exactly find the, the oldest activation point or the insertion point of the atrial site. So look at the 3D map. This is the NAMIX map. So this is the annulus area and this is actually the, uh, the pathway insertion point. You can see here, this is the oldest uh, atrial, th this is the uh, oldest atrial electrogram. So you can see this is a big A, but you can see here, this is the annulus activation, you can see the VA is far away. So VA time, conduction time is longer than this region. So this, you can see the target area, the big A, but also the, the this is far field V. But this is the annulus region. You can see the there's a conduction delay from the insertion point to the annulus because some of the cases, they failed by at least one time of previous ablation. So here's the other example. Also, the oldest activation point is here. But you can see 
this is V, this is A, this is the uh, pathway potential, so this is the oldest activating point. But look at the annulus conduction, VA conduction, this is VA conduction. So the conduction time is much longer than the conduction time at this point. So this is really the epicardial insertion point to the uh, right atrium. So when you map along the region, you cannot find a good uh, target electrogram at this uh, annulus region. So this is our case uh, series, all the uh, right atrial free wall extra pathways. So the insertion point are, are away from the annual region, but some of the pathways, they really are the uh, broadband pathways. So look at the target electrogram. You can see the big A, small far field V, and most of the cases you can have the uh, uh, pathway potential. So this is pathway potential. This is pathway potential. Also here, the pathway potential you can see the pathway potential. So these are the insertion point away from the annulus. So when you try to ablate the actual pathway, the free uh, wall pathway in this region, often the three dimensional mapping is uh, necessary. So this is a typical case. So you can see here, this is V, this is A, between V and A, you can see a very nice actual pathway potential, sharp potential. So this is exactly the insertion point of the extra pathway to the right atrium. So when you ablate here, you can see VA dissociation immediately. But after the atrial electrogram, you can see this segment is elevated. So this is the atrial injury uh, sign. So th this also suggesting the, the ablation site is at the atrial site. So after I deliver it, you can see the beautiful VA dissociation and the, the data will disappear after ventricular pacing. So you can see normal AV conduction. And these two are very uh, interesting cases because these two cases are failed by previous two attacks. You can see the insertion point is here, but there's a slow conduction between the insertion point to the, to the annulus region because of most of the IF deliveries along the uh, uh, TV annulus region by the previous ablations. You can see this case also. So there's a slow conduction from the insertion point to the annulus region. You can see here, this is a, a pacing artifact. This is the uh, V and this is A. You can see VA region in this area, the annulus area. The, the, the activation time is much, much longer than the VA region here. So this is the beautiful VA conduction. So this is also there's a action pathway potential between V and A, so at this region. So these examples suggesting that the pathway insertion point of the atrial side is away from the annulus. So when you conventionally map along the annulus, you cannot find a good the, the target point for you to uh, successfully block the uh, extra pathway. So you should move over to the more atrial side to search the, the oldest atrial activation. So this is also a very uh, interesting case. So this is the broadband uh, right side extra pathway. So this is uh, the conduction from V to A over two regions. One is the free, uh, atrial free wall side. The other is the septal side. So A mean no side. So this is competing activation, uh, retrograde conduction uh, from V to A. This is from the X pathway, but this is from the AV node. But when you ablate the oldest activation here, you can see that th this is the, uh, the oldest activation. So you, the, the, the target side, you can see the V, small V and big A. You can see the uh, uh, sharp potential between V and A. So this is a very uh, beautiful pathway potential. When you ablate here, you can see VA, you know, apart, and the activation actually is maybe a, a switch over from the pathway to AV node. So at this specific region, you can see VA conduction time is much longer. This is VA and this is VA, so much longer than before ablation. And but when you uh, stop the uh, ablation, you can see the anti conduction is still here, but the morphology changed. And then we map, then we map to the uh, uh, 
above side to the side uh, above the uh, previous ablation, and you can see a very uh, uh, so this is the uh, very uh, uh, beautiful small a and v. So I uh, also discussed this case with Sonny Jackman. He told me that this big potential is the extra pathway potential, and this is far field V. So when we apply here, almost the, the time clock of the TV annulus, the VAV, uh, you know, the conduction is over the AV node, the anti gray conduction over pathway was successfully uh, blocked. And then we uh, uh, do the RV pacing with adenosine, you can see a beautiful via dissociation. Actually, the ablation point, so this is the uh, coronary, right coronary artery. So this is the ablation points. You can see it. often the uh, right coronary artery is at the annulus level, but the ablation site is away from the uh, uh, annulus uh, level. So these are our only uh, case series. You can see the, uh, the atrial insertion point to the annulus almost uh, 15 uh, millimeters away. And most of the cases, they have an average of previous attempts, failed attempts of twice. And these are the x-rays and the procedure time. So we published in 2010 in uh, JCE about uh, this case series. But some, in some time, this approach does not often uh, achieve the successful ablation because we, we also had some uh, uh, broadband cases. So this is a, a, a very uh, broadband epicardial extra pathway. So the, the uh, 58 years old and paroxysmal palpitation for 10 years, baseline the WPWB and during tachycardia, narrow cast uh, tachycardia and refractory amiodarone and propapinum. But you can see the, the ablation failed four times before Refer to our hospital. You can see this is the uh, ECG surface, ECG typical right extra pathway. So this is uh, uh, precordially V1, V2, and th this is the uh, lead two, uh, lead three, and uh, this is uh, AVF. So uh, this is a, a free wall extra pathway at the uh, eight o'clock, or maybe uh, uh, a little bit lower. So this is the SVT, typical narrow cast tachycardia, but the painful point for this patient is that the patient had repetitive uh, SVT uh, every day, but after each termination of SVT, you can have a long pause, a very long pause. And this tachycardia is also refractory to antiarrhythmic drugs. So then we decided to do the atrial map to search the oldest activation. But you can see this is the Row region of OLIS activation. So this is the annulus area. This is the OLIS activation area. As we, as we suppose that this is an epicardial far away from the annulus. But you can see here, when you ablate all these regions, the extra pathway cannot be successfully uh, blocked. This is the uh, uh, fluid row showing the, the uh, ablation catheter is a little bit far from the annulus, and this is the, the target electrogram, but this case, fifth time failed. And then we decided for the sixth time to do the epicardial map. You can see here, we do the epicardial puncture to the pericardial sac. You can, this is the, the uh, ablation catheter and the oldest activation here uh, area. So you can see here, this is really the oldest activation. And you can see the beautiful extra pathway potential between B and A, but because this is exactly the right coronary artery, so you cannot deliver the ice energy here. Otherwise, you can cause the uh, the uh, uh, complete block, the, the the close of the uh, right coronary artery. So we give up the we give up here, and then we decide to, to refer to the uh, cardiac surgeons. So using the limit thoracotomy approach, we clearly show the annulus here. So these are the previous ablation point. So this is a really a broadband from almost at the base level of the right appendage to the whole right atrial free wall. These are all the previous lesions. But when we uh, 
Then we do the uh, tachycardia map. You can see this is the TV9, TV10. So the oldest activation is close to the TV9 area. And this is the electric probe. So only 10 volts broke AP epicardia, but close to the appendage area of the uh, appendage base. But after that, we, we are using the adenosine and isoprenorol to uh, double check the uh, extra pathway was bidirectional block. But unfortunately, when you, when you are using adenosine, you can see the extra pathway. This is the anti-grade, the extra pathway uh, conduction. And then we decided to, to do the more lesions at the, ba at the base of the uh, appendage. So this, it, this is the, exactly the region. So we, we did a small cut here and a sewing here. And after that, the uh, VA was, uh, the anti-grid conduction and retrograde conduction was both uh, blocked. And we, we are using the adenosine, uh, triphos triphosphate adenosine to double check whether it's bidirectional, uh, bidirectionally blocked. And so finally, this case was successfully blocked. But this is the six times and this is the surgical intervention. So this is really the tough case, the broadband all the way from eight o'clock to 10 o'clock. And here's some other challenges for the right extra pathway. Uh, this is the energy problem and cast uh, stability, but these uh, challenges can be overcome by irrigation catheter, the long sheets or to all the uh, different the, uh, uh, approaches and here's are the different, the pre-shaped lung sheaths to make you to have a good contact with the local tissue along the annulus. So uh, swaths R2, R3, R4. And uh, with these lung sheaths, you can easily uh, put your ablation catheter to the uh, uh, exact point of the actual pathway. And if you have any delivery problem, sometimes you can use it you, you can use the uh, uh, irrigation capital. So here's the experience from our Bordeaux group and they, they did 18 cases of extra pathway failed by previous ablation, but when they are using the irrigation capital, all these uh, pathways are gone. And here's a, uh, another approach we are doing for the uh, uh, failed ablation uh, cases. So this is, is our experience so we often advance the catheter to the right ventricle, curve back to the annulus region. So this is not like our previous experience on the atrial side, but this is on the ventricular side, close to the annulus region. So you can see the different regions. We are using uh, different curves to touch the uh, pathway area. So this is also a good way, a good approach for those tough cases or for those failed cases if, for, if the catheter stability is not so good for you to, to do a uh, cast ablation. And we published two years ago for these uh, tough, tough case uh, series. And finally, the, this is the home message for the uh, right uh, free wall extra pathway. So we should completely understand the cardiac anatomy of the extra pathway and full knowledge of the AP electrophysiology and hardened experience. Also, we should know the bi uh, biophysics of uh, radio frequency energy. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for a very good you know, summary on tackling right free wall accessory pathways. Indeed, those are very challenging uh, accessory pathways to ablate. Um, for the participants, please, please feel free to key in your Q&A, your questions and then we could uh, hopefully answer them. Let me start. The, uh, I, no, I noted that you, in the last few slides where you uh, adopted a under the valve approach, under valve approach. Yeah. Can you share with us a little bit more about the safety, uh, any complications? And uh, I, I assume you will use open irrigated catheters and what are the power settings and duration of ablation that you would uh, you know, deploy. Okay, for uh, good question, Dr. Chin. Uh, the uh, safety, uh, I think the uh, 
safety profile is good because the, the energy often we are setting the power at 30 volts, but the, the question is the how to maneuver your capital to the uh, exact region. So uh, you need to have some uh, experience. Often, the, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the first step is to put your uh, deflectible capital to the right ventricle using your uh, long sheets. And also the sheets should be uh, uh, over the TV annulus, and then you curve back. So from uh, different regions, so you should have different, you know, curves to touch the uh, past region. I think what I should mention more importantly is the uh, parachis region. So when you are ablate some of the cases at the atrial side of parachis region, sometimes it's risky, but when you move over to the, uh, when you move over to the right ventricle and then you curve back, on the ventricular side to do the to eliminate the pass rate. I think this approach is safer than when you put your catheter on the atrial side because the atrial side, the 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 AV node is there, the fast pass rate is there. So often you can have the risk of the AV conduction block. But the ventricular side, I think it's uh, safer. But it's difficult to make this check code. You share with us. Uh, do you, I, I, you mentioned about the past set? Would would K, would a contact force catheters in these cases be um, be more advantageous? Contact force, contact force. I think the contact force catheter is stiff. You cannot make a curve like this. I see. Okay. There are some questions. Uh, how do you define the position of the tricuspid annulus in the study? Is there a yeah, fixed but, e to V ratio? Yes. This is the, uh, so uh, when you put your catheter on the ventricular side, often you have big A, but when, you, when your tip of the catheter is close to the annulus area, you can have a small A. So like the left extra pathway, you, you, you do the uh, pathway mapping retrogradely, and when you put your catheter to under the valve, under the annulus of the mitral valve, you can also have a small A and a big B, but here, the similar uh, recording. I have some questions about the EGMs that are recorded in the under valve approach. Um, I mean, sometimes it'd be great to see an accessory pathway potential. Mm -hmm. Commonly, it falls on top of the large V EGM. Are there any, you know, how, how do you, uh, any tricks, any suggestion how you could tease that to really identify the pathway potential, you know, for suitable ablation. Yeah, I think the pathway potential, uh, my experience that in this approach, the pathway potential is less common than the atrial side. I think maybe because the V is too big, A is too small, and often the, uh, because we are, too, uh, we are mapping the, uh, the, the uh, uh, pathway, during a ventricular pacing or during a tachycardia. So sometimes the, the, the pathway potential is not so clear. But I think in our case example, the, the, in the, uh, uh, on the paper the, uh, two years ago, one of the case example, the pathway potential at the parachis region is very clear. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't bring that case example. No, that's, that's good. Okay, uh, some, some questions about uh, ablating within the right atrial appendage. You know, how safe is it if it's a pathway that seems to cause into the right atrial appendage? What are your experience on that? You mean the uh, uh, right atrial appendage pathway? Correct. Yeah, the, uh, uh, yes, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, paper, the, the, the uh, previous studies showing the, the uh, epicardial extra pathway from direct conduction between the appendage to the uh, RV free wall, but I have, I, we, we haven't had such a case. Uh, Dr. Sonny Jackman's uh, case series, they had all the uh, failed cases, but in their case series of almost 200, but they had seven cases of the right atrial appendage pathway. Dr. Goyas is only a case report, but we haven't had such a case. And even in our toughest case, I mentioned uh, just now, 
the, the, that's the very broadband pathway always uh, almost cover the uh, eight o'clock region to the ten o'clock region. But finally, we leave, only leave the uh, fibers here. So we finally decided to uh, uh, upgrade it using the surgical uh, approaches. Uh, Dr. Chen, you know, the experience of the appendage com uh, connection from the R uh, right atrial appendage to the RV? Uh, personally, no, I'm not having a, haven't had a case, such a case yet. But yeah. uh, I think we, if you do need a, a blade within the appendage, we need to, uh, you know, I think contact force is useful. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, irrigated, of course. And you will have to use uh, short duration to look for, uh, to reduce the risk of complication within, if you ablate within the appendage, whether, whether it's left atrial appendage or right atrial appendage. So there's a question. Uh, maybe the consider eyes. Uh, eyes would be useful too, yes, very maybe good. Maybe consider eyes to look for where, where the, the thicker part is, perhaps. Uh, good, good comment. Uh, eyes will to give you good visualization of the catheter tip tissue interface. That would be useful. And to look for sudden bursts of, uh, of bubbles, you know. That is a uh, warning for impending steam pop. So if you notice this irrigation just goes through like, like a storm, you have to stop ablation, that may prevent a steam pop. Uh, Dr. Chen, you know, for uh, a pathway in the right atrial, anterior lateral or TV 12 o'clock region, there are some questions whether, have you done it through the juggler approach? And would you recommend it? Uh, yeah, we, we don't do that, but uh, Dr. Ma in Beijing, they do the Changri approach. But the, the, this is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, roof, uh, roof region of the uh, uh, right TV angles area. So often is like from TV uh, 10 to TV uh, 12. So when they, the, the, the cat, the, you cannot have a very good contact the, the catheter is not so stable here. So then they will do the jungle approach. Also, the way like this, move over to the ventricle curve back, curve up to the underbag region. Uh, yeah, thanks for the comment. I think most of us uh, with the availability of the, the flexible sheath, like an ageless mm -hmm. sheath, um, and most of us uh, do not attempt the jugular approach. What about, okay. when, what about when do you do a coronary angiogram a right coronary arterial angiogram for the right free wall pathway. When, do you always do it, or when do you no, no. do it to no, reduce the risk it, of complication? Yeah, we 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 we, we did a right coronary angiography because in our uh, case series study, we tried to make sure that this insertion point is far away from the annulus because the right coronary artery is exactly the level of the right. Uh, uh, TV annulus. So the, then the, we, we try to make sure from the floral to see the ablation catheter is away from the annulus, but not that's not the uh, the regular practice for all the uh, right side extra pathway. But we well, only had one case we need uh, we, we 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 did using the uh, uh, epicardial approach by the uh, the the. Uh, substituted uh, needle uh, puncture to the epicardial space to do epicardial map, but often the actual pathway point is the right coronary artery uh, location. So uh, you, you cannot deliver IF, uh, energy there. All right, thank you. And maybe one last question from the audience would be, in left-sided accessory pathway, is your preference uh, transeptal or retrograde aortic approach, Dr. Chen. So uh, now we are, my, my preparation is transept. All right, any reasons for that? Uh, I think the, uh, because most of the left, left sided extra pathway, they are concealed uh, left extra pathway. So you should localize your oldest atrial activation point, right? And some of the cases, the left extra pathway is in oblique course. Often the atrial insertion point and the ventricular insertion point, they are not at the same level. So if you can map the oldest activation of the atrium 
I think that's the good point for the left atrial pathway ablation. But if you do the retrograde pathway, the A is farther, the atrial signal is farther signal, not the true atrial signal from the pathway area. So if you deliver after energy, you, you are at the ventricular side, not at the atrial side. So this is the anatomic explanation, interpret, interpretation for the atrial uh, transceptor approach. The other one is, if you do the uh, uh, transceptor approach, you only use the venous approach, don't use the, the art, arterial approach. A good point. So Paul, what about you? I personally, uh, I personally use the transceptor approach, although there are definitely pitfalls to that. Um, I think last time we used to, uh, remember our center, we used to predominantly do retrograde aortic approach because to avoid the transeptal. But as that's getting much more and more common, uh, we're getting more used to this procedure and we are getting, uh, we are less worried about the complications of it. Of course, mapping is easier uh, with the transeptal approach. However, yeah. stability is, uh, stability also is uh, slightly more of a problem as compared to the retrograde aortic approach where stability is a bit better, especially in the transceptal approach where it's an anterior lateral uh, pathway. Sometimes stability may be a concern. So um, sometimes I overcome that by using a contact force, actually. I use the contact force catheter. Um, so far, I haven't really had a real necessity to use a deflectable sheath. But of course, that will be on the table if I can't get good contact. Um, and Prof, your, yourself, I know you use the retrograde aortic approach. What are your thoughts? I think, uh, you know, whatever approaches, my, the key take home is that you are comfortable and you're confident in that approach. And you're able to maneuver the catheters uh, confidently to the site of uh, choice ablation. And there are pros and cons for each approach. And um, there's a learning curve to moving the catheter retrogradely. Uh, to map under the valve or map above the valve as it is with a transceptor approach. Whichever approach, just gain enough experience, gain enough competence and, and it should work for you in your lab. Um, but I do agree, perhaps the transceptor approach has a shorter learning curve. Um, I mean, most of us are doing lab atrial work anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Atrial tech, atrial uh, fib, you know, um, so that has perhaps a shorter learning curve. All right, uh, maybe... Um, so Dr. Um, Dr. Chen, Dr. Smart yes, question. when you train your fellows, so do you uh, introduce the transept approach to your fellow post or the retrograde approach to your fellow post? So I think that depends on the operator. I, I tend to go for retrograde because I have less, uh, less preparation time from, uh, to prepare for a transeptal. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think Dr. Paul would proceed to a transeptal and the, fellow, the whole team, including the fellow, will do the transceptor and map mm -hmm. accordingly. Mm. Okay, one last question. Any, any uh, occurrence of ferric nerve injury in the right free wall ablation, Dr. Chen? Uh, no. So in the, the, uh, the uh, flagging nerve da uh, damage, like the uh, AF ablation, the flagging nerve damage, right? Correct. No. I think the yeah, the 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 anatomy of phrenic nerve is more more the SBC you know near near the R uh, right 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 superior palmy vein region so uh, yeah. on the wall, a, a little less uh, chance I think a possible but less less so uh, with the approach yeah um, even the uh, right uh, pathway the uh, atrial insertion point is a uh, a little a little bit away from the annulus but not that way that away to like the, the, the uh, uh, fragment nerve. I think fragment nerve is, is more free wall, not close to the uh, annulus region. Yeah, that's correct. I think uh, we have come to the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, I think uh, as all good things, all good things must come to an end. Uh, we hopefully have answered the questions uh, posed by the attendee. And before we end, are there any last, com no last, uh, some advice, uh, Dr. Chen, to our young budding EP doctors. I'm sorry? No, I'm, I'm, sorry. 
Yeah, Dr. Chen, maybe, maybe I'd like you to offer one advice to our young budding EP doctors who are attending this webinar. Okay, actually, this is like my uh, home message. So when you, because the extra pathway, I think that's the first lesson for the uh, EP starters or the EP fellows. So I think the, you, you should know the anatomy of the heart. You should know the uh, electrophysiology of the extra pathway. So like Dr. Paul, Dr. Ching, just the, the, the two educational cases, very uh, uh, educational uh, information. So the uh, uh, basic EP knowledge of the extra pathway, the uh, AV nodal pa the, the uh, AV nodal reentry. So I think this is very much uh, important. And then the, uh, you should know the, uh, the uh, energy sources and also the, uh, the biophysics of the uh, eye for, uh, ablation. And the, I think the catheter skill, the, the manipulating of the catheter skill, it's uh, not, not that important. It, it works, but not that important. But the basic knowledge about anatomy, about electrophysiology, about the biophysics of eye fibrillation, it's even sometimes even more important than the manipulation itself. Thank you, Paul. Any uh, advice to our young EP doctors? So my thoughts are that um, there are a lot of EP maneuvers uh, around that have been documented. A lot of them are modifications and very complex. But um, I think the main thing, like similar to the first, uh, so we look for be sure of your EP maneuvers and know that which ones are more definitive, such as for example. The VA, like in the first case, the steam A minus VA time, that one is definitely less confusing than when you do a PPI minus tachycardia cycle line because there are so many, uh, so many variable components. So know which ones are your go-to maneuvers. And if you encounter a difficult case, uh, it's always back to the basics. Think through what are the main things that, main features that you need to identify. And of course, uh, the last thing is, it's always uh, nice to have a good friend to do case when you need, when you need, uh, need any of help. You can call upon a friend because uh, definitely two minds are better than one. And uh, all the best to your endeavors, to, uh, to your journey with EP. And it takes a while, but uh, I think everybody will get there. All right, thank you. So that's, that's absolutely correct. Be more eager to learn about EGMs pacing the maneuvers, anatomy, uh, then moving the catheter. And with that, I want to thank you all for attending, and especially to the faculty, Dr. Chen and uh, Dr. Paul Lim, for this uh, session on anatomy and difficult EGMs in the SVT. So I wish you a good uh, weekend ahead. Thank you. Bye.